everybody. Um, it's great to be here and sorry for those technical problems. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm on unceded Bunwarung country as an uninvited guest. And uh, I acknowledge all the Aboriginal and Indigenous people that are listening today. And uh, thank you organisers and thank you for everyone who works so hard in this space. And uh, this is when we find out whether my slides will work or not. Okay, so um, like I said, I'm an invited guest here uh, on this beautiful ancestral land and want to pay my respects to elders past, present and uh, all First Nations people listening. Uh, my background, as Tasneem said, I'm a nurse and um, what I'm planning to do today is tell you about a small teeny weeny project and just also want to acknowledge uh, Toby's amazing work um, which he just presented and I think what was really important about what you said Toby um, was the issue of low levels of trust, uh, low levels of health and system literacy are things that perhaps um, will have resonances in this presentation as well. So thank you for setting the scene. And I'm just gonna talk um, a little bit about the research, but mainly um, share with you why I thought it would be useful to have images. Uh, so I wanna acknowledge, you know, we talk a bit about uh, it taking a village to raise a child. I also think it takes a village to support people as they get older and it takes a village to do research. So none of this is my work alone and those are some of the people who've been part of this. Uh, and I particularly want to acknowledge Safta Ahmed who's an amazing artist and he's just published a graphic novel about uh, people in detention. So um, you will know mostly this most of this, people who are listening and watching. So I'm not gonna talk for too long about, about this and you'll be hearing about it all afternoon. Um, the largest proportion of migrants are found in Western Australia, followed by New South Wales and Victoria. And we know that older migrants uh, are likely to settle in urban areas. So why research about social isolation? We know that um, as people get older, that uh, opportunities to engage might be reduced. And then in the context of COVID-19, um, instructions to physically distance have kind of um, added to that challenge of trying to uh, catch up with people. And uh, as Tasneem pointed out in her introduction, there are also inequalities to accessing and using technology. So what that does mean is that quite often there's increased risk of um, different kinds of problems, uh, whether they're cardiovascular, et cetera, you know, heart, your immune system, mental health, you know, getting depressed and so on. So we also know that um, older people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds might also uh, have less disposable income and face barriers in accessing services. So what we did was we wanted to find out about social isolation and loneliness. And the thing that's interesting about those two terms is that loneliness is that feeling that you might experience yourself. Um, so it's subjective. And social isolation is a measure that researchers often make. So you might be living with a lot of people, but whether you feel connected and supported and listened to, uh, so, you know, it, it is really important because um, sometimes we assume that people who live alone are not lonely and that people who live with others um, aren't lonely. So... You know, I think it's important to, to challenge those things. So we wanted to find out about how they use health systems and technology to connect and what might actually help this group to access services. And as Toby was saying, uh, particularly if they might not really trust services. So what we did, and I'm going to skip through this because I started late and I don't want to mess up the whole afternoon for everybody. Um, but what we did was we recruited through organizations like 
uh, Brimbank City Council, Victorian Multicultural Commission and our networks. And we talked to 10 people from Brazil, Egypt, Greece, Hong Kong, Italy, Malta and Sri Lanka, and all but one lived in Melbourne. And what we found is that people lost a lot of their usual ways of communicating and engaging. And even though some people got daily phone calls or their families phoned them, they really struggled and their digital literacies varied. Many people were very dependent on their phones and very reluctant to engage in video conferencing. And for some of them, it was devastating to miss significant family events. So one of my participants that I spoke to, she lost her brother and she said, how can I grieve for my brother who I've known for 79 years? How can I grieve in a short funeral with hardly anybody, with no one at home but my partner and I, my husband and I? So it was quite quite difficult for people. Um, so this is the beautiful art that um, Safta did. And um, our conclusion was that we need to actually understand more about how people use technology. And particularly having community-oriented activities that can promote meaningful online connection. So it was very interesting and challenging trying to do research without actually being with people. Um, so things like how, how you establish rapport when you couldn't see people and they couldn't see you. And the pluses, obviously, was that it was very uh, easy to overcome geographic limitations. Um, it was really hard, though, not talking to people and not being able to be hospitable. I'm going to skip over this one, but we had hoped we might be able to take photos or send people cameras to take photos of their environment. Um, but mail issues were also a problem. So in terms of using art and research, we know that um, people have used photo voice, which is where you give people cameras, um, that people have been invited to write poetry, um, and that also art's used to share the findings. And I was really interested in how we could go beyond art for health promotion or using it to, to dance or to make spaces beautiful, um, to increase access. I was interested in how we might be able to share the findings so that people could recognize themselves in um, whatever was produced. So one of the questions that I had was, can comics have a serious role? And can the graphics themselves be medicine? And I think they could be really useful for teaching, sharing with those who are going through a similar experience and so on. So again, I'm conscious of time, so I, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but I'm really interested in how we might share research in ways that are accessible, appealing. Uh, and as you can see, I've got very dense text there, but I think what images do is they take us away from the text, which is really nice, and capture a feeling. Uh, you know, we can engage empathically, and I think that's really exciting. And so what we did to do this was um, we pr prepared little summaries of every participant, and then we converted these stories into visual components. And the thing that was interesting as well is because we'd never met the participants, we'd never seen them and neither had the artists, um, we could maintain the privacy of the participants. So I just wanna check in with our organizers whether I've got time for a few more slides. It'll take two more minutes. Yes, of course. Awesome. Okay, thank you. Um, the thing that was interesting is that before these were published in The Guardian, so if you're interested in, in reading that, you can Google my name and you'll find them. Um, I contacted the participants and I shared the images with them. And one of them, uh, this is a Sri Lankan woman who took part in the research, was she, she felt really weird about seeing herself. She sort of felt like it didn't look like her, obviously, because we hadn't met her. But also it's how she felt a few months ago. You know, she wasn't feeling the same way now. Um, we got feedback that was very, very immediate. Uh, 
Um, and the thing that I kind of wonder is whether funders are interested in this kind of research or whether they find written reports more rigorous. Um, I just want to share with you a little bit of feedback before I finish and um, got some, a lot of really unsolicited feedback, which was very exciting. Um, and of course, I put in the first part of the, the quote so that I could look good there. Um, but um, I was so excited that this work was going to be shared with um, aged care students at a university. Um, and then I got contacted by a nurse who worked in surgery. And I'll let you read that if you're a speed reader. But um, she was very, very upset because her uh, nephew, who was an only son, was lost in a motor vehicle accident in Melbourne. And basically all the goodbyes were by Zoom. And she could really relate to one of the stories that I mentioned earlier where the woman couldn't be there for the funeral. So this um, very sad story was the nurse who worked in theatre planted 200 trees in his memory. Um, but, you know, how, how sad not to be able to grieve um, with other people. Um, other people, educators said to me that it was a wonderful, lighthearted way of sharing research. Uh, and especially some of the sad messages. But even though it's sad, there was an aliveness about them, as you can, you can see here. Um, other people said to me that the voices of the participants could be clearly heard and felt, and that they learned a lot, even though it wasn't their area of expertise. So to conclude, I think that um, providing, doing research in a virtual qualitative way, way uh, provided me and the team with a unique kind of opportunity to try and do research in a, an interesting way. And I think that so often research is disseminated in very conventional formats, and those formats can exclude people and their loved ones. So I was really excited about making something that people could um, recognize and enjoy. And um, one of the women, I, I talked to her son and she said that although the woman didn't like it herself because she felt embarrassed, um, that the grandchildren really loved it and they saw it as a really nice way to kind of capture a moment from, uh, from COVID times um, that was very precious to the family. So thank you, everybody. I hope you've gotten something useful about that presentation. I'm sorry for the technical hiccups and uh, just really want to acknowledge all the hard work that all of you do for your communities and uh, enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you.